Good morning and welcome to Nature Live Online. I'm Alison, I'm your host for today. Now, if you're not familiar with Nature Live, we're an event that usually happens at the Natural History Museum in London, where we give you a chance to meet and speak with some of our scientists, researchers, curators that work behind the scenes at the museum and find out a bit more about what they do. Now, we can't be at the museum right now. So instead, we're bringing our science and our scientists direct from our homes to yours. Now, in a minute, I'm going to be joined by one of our curators, Emma, and we're going to be diving into the weird and wonderful world of sharks. Now, I've got plenty of questions for Emma, but we would also love to hear from you, our audience. Please, please don't be shy. If you've got any questions about our topic today, post them in the comments and we'll do our very best to answer as many of them as we can. But let's meet our scientist for today, Emma. Are you there? Can you hear us okay? Hi there. Hi, everyone. Hey. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Brilliant. Now, Emma, tell us all what you do at the museum. Yes, yeah, so I'm one of the curators at the Natural History Museum in London. Uh, so as a curator, I'm specifically responsible for the fossil fish collection that we have which is about 100,000 specimens. So uh, we've got a selection of different images of me uh, doing my job. Um, and the, so apart from wearing a lot of pink, um, in the bottom corner, you can sort of see me in my natural habitat. So that's in the collections, uh, looking after them. So we need to know what they are, where they came from, how old they are. And I provide access to those collections for lots of different scientists all around the world that want to come to the museum to study them. However, if they can't actually make it into the museum, I provide them with loans and different data to allow them to progress. I also do some of my own research, uh, some of which is on sharks, and we're going to be finding out a little bit more about that later on in the show. Um, I'm also really lucky and I get to go and travel all around the world to dig up fossils. So I'm really living my childhood dream here, actually. Um, and so we go out, we excavate these fossils and we bring them back into the museum, um, again, to allow other people to see them and also study them. And a great part of my job, along with doing exhibitions, is also doing events like today, where I get to speak about um, one of my favourite subjects, which is sharks and fossils. Yes, I know you do love to, to talk about sharks, which is fantastic. <laughs> but, but why sharks? Why are, why are they so brilliant? I just think that they're absolutely amazing animals. They've been around on this planet for such a long time. Uh, they're really fascinating. They live in so many different types of environment, eat lots of like a wide variety of different uh, foods. And um, they're just such amazing, graceful uh, creatures. And hopefully by the end of the show, you guys will all be thinking the same thing. <laughs> I have no doubt you're going to convert some people today. <laughs> Now, Emma, you are uh, a curator of fossil fish, uh, which uh, would uh, lead us to believe that sharks have been around for quite some time. But how long? How old are they? I believe you want to start us off with a, with a bit of a quiz this morning to get our brains working. Tell us about that. Yeah, so this is um, sort of a very fun, simple quiz that everybody can hopefully get involved in at home. So we're going to show you a picture um, of a different animal and your job is to guess whether that animal is, um, whether sharks are older or younger than that animal. So I think we'll get okay. started first. <laughs> okay, so what, what is our first animal then? Let's, let's take a look. So the first one that we're going to be looking at um, are humans. So that's you Huge and I. Friend. <laughs> okay, so are sharks older or younger than humans? Now, is that that seems to be kind of an easy question, surely. Sharks surely have been around for, for longer than humans. Well, hopefully it's a nice easy one to sort of ease us into this quiz. <laughs> if you want to play along at home, uh, post your guesses in the comments. But I think I'm going to guess that sharks are older than humans. Yep, so shall we have a little look? So it's a good guess. Let's have a look. So sharks are indeed older than humans. So well done if you got that correct. Uh, don't <laughs> worry, minute, we've got um, a few other quizzes to have a go at as well. Uh, but some of the earliest human fossils that we can find are about 300,000 years old. So quite recently, geologically speaking. Now let's take a look at our next species. Uh, I reckon, oh, this one is, is a bit trickier, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. So it's a little bit of a trickier one, just to sort of make it a little bit harder. Uh, so dinosaurs, so are sharks older or younger than dinosaurs? 
we have our fantastic uh, stegosaur specimen that we have on display in the Natural History Museum in London. Here's an example. Uh, but our sharks, um, are they older, younger than dinosaurs. So maybe have a little bit of a guess at home, Alison. Yeah, you... post your guesses in the comments. That's much trickier because dinosaurs, they had a pretty good innings, didn't they? They, they were around for quite yeah. some time. Um, I'm going to say sharks are older, but I'm not 100% yeah. sure. <laughs> <laughs> so a bit of a guess there from Alison. Uh, hopefully you guys are uh, having some good guesses at home. Uh, so shall we take a look? Let's take a look. Oh, yeah. so well done, Alison. Great job. Good wow. answer. Uh, sharks are indeed older than dinosaurs. So the dinosaurs first evolved about 230 million years ago, and that's where we can find some of the earliest fossils of dinosaurs. And um, so we often think of dinosaurs as being really old and ancient, but sharks were swimming around in the waters way before dinosaurs were stomping around on land. And that to me, I think absolutely fascinating. Absolutely. Now we've got one more uh, animal, haven't we, to guess. So, so let's take a look at that. Bony fish. Yeah, mm. so making this even harder now, getting those brain cells working. Uh, so bony fish, so think about like your goldfish that you might have at home, cod, heron, uh, their skeleton is made of bone, very similar to our own. Uh, but sharks are a bit different. They are a group of fish. They are cartilaginous fishes. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. But for the moment, uh, do we think sharks are older or younger than bony fish? That is tricky, actually, because you might think that that having a skeleton might be quite primitive. Yeah. But maybe not. Did bones come first? Oh, I'm not sure about that one. Uh, yeah. Hopefully our, our audience are, uh, are guessing much better than I am. But sh should we reveal the answer? Yeah, let's reveal the answer. Yeah, so well Yum. done if you've got this one right um, at home, because it is quite a tricky one. So bony fish, they um, evolved about 480 million years ago. So a really long time ago. And sharks are indeed younger than bony fish. They evolved after the first bony fish that we find. Uh, so we've got a very simple timeline here that we're going to put up on the screen. And that will show you just sort of where everything sort of fits in. So uh, sharks actually evolved about 420 million years ago. So that's nearly 200 million years before dinosaurs evolved and they're still around today. So yeah, they're absolutely fantastic. They've been around for such a long time. That is pretty impressive. But Emma, what then makes a shark a shark? What, what are some of their key features? Is it just that they've got that, that cartilage and a skeleton? Mm, yeah, so that's a, a really good question actually. And it's something that I'm asked quite a lot. Uh, so one of the first key um, features of a shark are its gills. So all fish have gills and that's how they are able to absorb oxygen into their bodies. So the gills that I'm talking about on a shark, they're on the side of the body and it's those um, sort of five slits that you can just see on its side in front of um, the, fin at the side of its body there. Now bony fish, they do have gills as well, but often they're actually covered with a little flap. So you don't actually see them, but with sharks, you can see those gills. And depending on the species of shark, their number of gills varies, but more um, often than not, it's five gills um, slits at the side that they have. And their skin is quite interesting as well, isn't it? Yeah, the first time that I saw uh, some of their skin under um, an SEM, so this is a very powerful uh, microscope that allows us to look at their skin. I was amazed, it absolutely blew my mind. Um, so these are very um, teeny tiny little dermal denticles or scales of the shark. And basically these are very similar to teeth. That's what they're actually made up from. So their entire skin is made of basically teeny tiny little teeth. And now these teeth all point backwards. So if you were to uh, stroke a shark, I wouldn't recommend it, but if you are, uh, from the head to the tail, it's quite smooth. But if you go in the other direction, it's quite rough. It feels very much like sandpaper. And because these dermal denticles are all pointing backwards, it allows the shark to be streamlined and sharks are very efficient swimmers. So much so uh, that there's uh, swimwear companies that are actually studying sharks, looking at their skin in order to improve their own swimwear. That's fantastic. <laughs> now, um, we mentioned earlier that, that sharks don't have bony skeletons. How well uh, then do they fossilise? Do we have any shark skeletons in our collections? 
Yeah, so um, shark skeletons are actually very, very rare in um, any museum's collections. Uh, we are very fortunate that we do have some in the museum. So what we have on the screen now is a vertebrae or a piece of backbone from a shark. So if you were to run your finger up and down your spine, you can feel little bumps. So each one of those bumps is a vertebrae, and that's what we have on the screen there, but this, this one's from a shark. And on the picture on the other side, that's me in a cave digging up a 10 meter long shark. So each one of these vertebrae was about the size of my hand uh, or the size of a saucer you might have at home. So this is cartilage and we can find that in our bodies, either in our ears, we give them a little wiggle, and or on our noses, so you can give your front of your nose a little wiggle as well. So that's soft tissue, it doesn't tend to fossilise very well. But if we get the right circumstances when the shark dies, it will fall down to the bottom of the water and get covered in sand and mud and sediment very, very quickly something that we call an anoxic environment. So not even bacteria can come and eat all the soft tissue. And um, if that does happen, perhaps over a few hundred thousands of years, even a few millions of years, if we're very lucky, we get that soft tissue preserved. So we can then uh, build up a bigger picture of what these ancient sharks actually looked like. Fantastic. And we're lucky, obviously, to have have these vertebrae in our collections. But there, there is one uh, part of a shark that we have an awful lot of, isn't there? That's its teeth. Why? Why so many teeth? Yeah, so I think when most people think of a shark, they automatically think of their teeth. Um, and actually, sharks' teeth are one of the most common fossils that you can find. And that's because sharks get through an awful lot of teeth in their lifetime. So in the box here, and um, that's actually a lifetime supply of teeth from one shark. So in that box, there's actually about 30,000 teeth within there. So depending on the species of shark, they can have between 20 and 40,000 teeth in a lifetime, which is pretty wow. amazing. One so, shark, that many? Yeah, indeed. So, oh. um, yeah, so we, um, one of the reasons why is they've got this conveyor belt system of teeth. So as soon as one tooth falls out of the front of their um, mouths, there's a, several different rows of teeth behind it ready to replace. And if you think about it, that's a really um, great system because if you were to damage one of your teeth, well, we can go to uh, the dentist and have a very expensive dental bill. But obviously, <laughs> sharks can't do that. So um, if they have no teeth, they obviously can't eat, so they'll die. But if they're able to constantly replace their teeth so they've got nice, sharp teeth ready to um, eat their foods, they're more likely to survive. That is impressive. I, I kind of wish that I, I had the same system, to be honest. <laughs> really really handy <laughs> now i know we've got some uh, questions coming in uh, from our audience now uh, i'm asking about uh, megalodon if, if you'll forgive us guys we're going to hold off yeah. on that for now because we're going to come uh, to megalodon a little bit later we couldn't miss that one could we really yeah. uh, we did have uh, a question uh, just one question let me uh, see if i can find it uh, from a six-year-old John, um, and he wants to know what sharks were around at the time of, um, I might pronounce this wrong, uh, Liopleurodon? Oh, Liopleurodon, okay, so that's a human, um, mammal, marine mammal that lived in the oceans, and we will be talking about that a little bit later because uh, some of the sharks that lived around then um, were animals like Megalodon, and that is definitely a shark we're going to be talking about. It's everybody's favourite. Um, and also lots of other sharks. So um, things like the ancestor to the sand tiger shark um, and other ones like that. So there was definitely a lot of sharks round about then. So we're talking round about um, 15 to 20 million years ago during the Eocene period. That's so, a great question. question. actually. Yeah, that's a brilliant question. Uh, we've got uh, another one come in. What's the oldest fossil that you have seen with your own eyes? Oh, wow. Okay. Right. Definitely. Have to think about <laughs> um, I think one of the oldest fossils that I've seen that are in the museum, and they're about 400 million years old. Um, and so we're really fortunate at the Natural History Museum in London that we have collections from all around the world from lots of different time periods. But some in the fossil fish collection um, are about 400 million uh, years old. Um, and that's really fascinating. And for me, the first time I was able to see these fossils and hold them in my hand, I got really excited just to think that I was one of the first people 
there to be seeing these fossils and actually holding them. Um, and that's one of the fantastic things about our collections is that every day we're able to open up these uh, drawers and cabinets and we've got access to these fantastic collections that really help us to build up um, a bigger picture of how ancient life lived. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, now, uh, we know that sharks have been around for a very long time, uh, but they haven't always looked quite how you might expect. So uh, what we wanted to do was uh, to, to show you some examples of some, some weird and wonderful extinct sharks. And we're going to start off uh, with, uh, well, one uh, one example that is a bit of a cheat because it's strictly speaking not a shark, is it? But but tell us about Helicoprium because I actually had a question from an audience about this one. Okay, yes. Yeah, so I'm being a little bit cheeky. Uh, so technically, Helicoprium <laughs> isn't actually a shark, but it's um, it, you know it's one of my favourites. So I could not put it in the show. And um, actually, for a long time, people did think that this was a shark. So what we have here is its lower jaw of this animal. Now, um, what we think Helicoprene did was basically gradually extend its jaw out over a number of different, uh, over several millions of years. And Helicoprene itself um, lived about uh, 250 million years ago. So it actually belongs to basically a sister group or the cousin group of the sharks, um, called a group called chimeras. And they're a very strange group um, of animals that we're not going to be talking about too much today, uh, but they're relative to sharks. So Helicoprian uh, lived during the Permian period, so just, sort of just before the dinosaurs um, started to evolve. So what we think this animal would do is to swim through the water and each one of these teeth would be perfect for slicing up things like jellyfish or other soft bodied um, animals. So this is a, an artist reconstruction of this animal. Now there's not an awful lot of fossils um, of this animal around in the world and actually the fossils that we have in the museum are casts. But that's one of the great things is that we obviously speak to our colleagues in all different museums around the world and we can exchange that knowledge and we can exchange pictures of these fossils, we can exchange uh, scans as well, which allows us to study these animals. Uh, so this, as I said, is an artist reconstruction. So sometimes it's referred to as the buzzsaw shark because <laughs> of um, the lower jaw where it would be slicing and dicing the uh, different animals. That's fantastic because that's actually answered a viewer question on uh, why Helicoprian has that weirdly shaped jaw. Um, so it's a feeding strategy. Yeah, um, and it's something that we're still sort of learning a lot more about this animal uh, because there's um, not many fossils around. Um, actually, if you go back maybe about 300, 400 years, some of the first fossils that were found, people thought that they might be ammonites because of this um, spiral shape. So ammonites are, quite again, quite common fossils. They're related to squid and octopus, and they've got this spiral. But then as more and more of these fossils were found, which is one of the reasons why we still actively go out and collect new fossils, um, that we realised that these were actually teeth and then realised that it was part of the lower jaw of this animal, again, as we found more fossils. And do we know how it actually evolved, presumably quite slowly over time? Yeah, so um, here we've got, again, it's one of the great things I've mentioned about the collections is I can look through the drawers and I can see actually how some of these animals evolved by going back to look at their ancestors. So we've got a couple of examples here. And that, again, that's its lower jaw. So again, standing out, you can see all the different teeth, those sort of triangular shaped ones, and then curving around. So that's how we're able to um, tell how these animals evolved by looking um, at similar animals, um, and also their ancestors and, and working forward. And while we're, we're on Helicoprian, uh, one of our viewers wants to know, could it close its mouth with a jaw like that? Yeah, so that is something that, um, again, we're still sort of properly trying to work out, but we think it probably would have been able to close its mouth, yeah. Uh, so it probably had a slightly higher arch in its upper jaw to allow it to close its mouth with that tooth whirl. Yeah, looks very uncomfortable. <laughs> Now, uh, let's take a look at our next extinct example of shark, because this one has a, another slightly strange adaptation, doesn't it? Let's take yeah. This. Yeah, so Stethacanthus, um, again, sometimes referred to as the ironing board shark in some books. And the reason <laughs> why um, I've chosen this one and how it gets its name, the ironing board shark, is because of the weird protrusion on its back. So we're very familiar with sharks having the dorsal fin, so that sort of triangular shaped fin on the back swimming through the water. But Stethacanthus had this strange anvil uh, type um, 
dorsal fin instead. And we think it was only um, with the males of this species. And the reason why we um, think that is that we only find this um, dorsal fin with male examples. So males, uh, they have claspers as their um, reproductive organs. So we can tell that, that automatically that, that fossil is male. And we only, as I said, we only find those um, protrusions with the males. So we think it's a bit like a peacock with its feathers displaying looking for a girlfriend. So we think this is how Stethacanthus tried to attract a mate. And do we find those sorts of differences between males, males and females in sharks living today? Yeah, so um, lots of different species have different ways that you can sort of tell the difference. Uh, some sharks um, around today, often actually the females are larger than the males and often have much thicker skin. Um, and that's to do with the mating process. Um, oh, there's also some sharks that again still have these little protrusions um, sticking up on the top of their bodies as well um, or strange little nodules um, above their eyes too. Now um, Emma there is uh, one shark we've already had some questions about unsurprisingly <laughs> <laughs> and that's Megalodon. Um, now we couldn't ignore Meg it's everyone's favourite shark isn't it? Um, we've got some teeth that we can show you today, haven't we? So, so Emma, tell us about Megalodon. Yeah, so Megalodon, um, yeah, everybody's heard of Megalodon, I think. Uh, the name Megalodon actually means big tooth, and you can definitely see that in this picture. So the black tooth that we have is a fossil tooth of a Megalodon, whereas the smaller white tooth on the other side is from a great white shark. Now we think of great white sharks being quite large sharks that are swimming around in our oceans today. They typically grow up to about five, five and a half metres in size. Whereas obviously we can see from this tooth, Megalodon would have been much, much bigger. Definitely. Do we have any, uh, any skeleton of Megalodon at all? Or is it just the teeth? Yeah, so it's a really good question. So as I mentioned before, um, obviously um, the soft tissue of sharks doesn't tend to fossilise very well. Um, so we've never actually found a complete skeleton of megalodon, but we have found lots and lots of their teeth. We found partial jaws and we found some of their vertebrae as well. So they're typically would have been about the size of a dinner plate, so much bigger than the vertebrae that I showed before. Uh, so this is a reconstruction of a megalodon jaw based on partial jaw fragments that we found. So you can see there, a prop, it would have swallowed me up in one big bite. It would, I just would have been a small little snack for it, I think. But because we've got um, all these fossils that we found and sharks are still around today, we can actually work out how big megalodon would have been. Wow, so, so how would we go about doing that? So what we can do is we can take lots of measurements from sharks that are around today and obviously we can measure them and say, OK, well, that shark has got a jaw of a certain size and it is this long. So we do that. We measure lots and um, hundreds and hundreds of different sharks to do that. And uh, we can come up with a very complicated equation, which hurts my head. So I much prefer this one that we've got here. So this is a very simplified equation to work out how big our shark is. So we can take what is the tooth row length, so basically from the front to the side of the jaw or a quarter of the size of the jaw. So if we were to do that on some of the fossils that we've found um, and times that by eight, that gives us what we call the precaudal length. So from the tip of the nose of the shark to where the tail starts. Now, depending on the type of shark, they've all got slightly different tails. Um, but we think Megalodon would look similar to what's on the diagram there. So we add on about 25% to that. So when we sort of add all that up together, when we take our measurements, we actually think Megalodon probably would have grown up to about 15, even 18 metres in length. So that's three times the size of a great white shark and it's longer than a bus. That is incredible. What were they eating? Presumably whatever they wanted. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so um yes an animal that size with big triangular shaped teeth that are serrated so basically their teeth on the sides look very similar to a knife so we can then work out okay what exactly what these animals are eating and obviously large animals things like whales dolphins large meaty animals um, but also, it's not just that, we also have the fossil evidence. So here we have a piece of whale bone with the megalodon tooth still embedded inside um, the bone. So you can see it's sort of got three scratches and that's from the teeth and the different rows of the megalodon jaw going back. 
And then as we zoom in a bit closer, you can actually just see the little tip, uh, sorry, the little tip of the megalodon tooth uh, broke off and is still embedded inside that bone. Well, that is pretty good evidence then in that case, isn't it? Wow. Yeah, no, it's really great evidence. So megalodon lived um, about um, 25 million years ago and went extinct. So it's now completely dead. It all, um, the whole lineage died out about three and a half million years ago. Um, we've got a question from a, 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 one of our viewers. Do we know how um, or why Megalodon went extinct? Yeah, that is a really good question. Um, so as with any extinction event, it's not necessarily just one factor. It's a combination of lots of different things. So at the time that Megalodon went extinct, uh, we actually think that there was about 35% of all marine animals also went extinct uh, due to climate change. Um, over um, a few millions of years, the climate and the oceans were getting much, much colder. And Megalodon liked really warm tropical water. So probably would have lived around about the equator, maybe sort of virtuing into the, sort of the Mediterranean as it is today. Um, but the waters were getting much, much colder. There was um, The water was being taken up into the ice caps at both the North and the South Pole. Um, so where Megalodon probably would have given birth in the shallower waters of what we call popping grounds, so that's what a baby shark's called is a pup, um, it basically lost its um, these nurseries where the smaller baby sharks were able to keep safe. There was also competition from lots of other animals that were around at the same time for different foods. So a number of different reasons. Basically, it was running out of food and it got a bit too cold as well. But it did survive for... Um, several millions of years so it did really well absolutely and i think we, we are we're very lucky we're very sure it's extinct aren't we we, we had a question <laughs> viewers earlier it's definitely extinct we yeah. would have surely yeah something that's 15 18 meters in size uh, we would know about it in the oceans because of what it would be eating we would see those bite marks we would see carcasses of perhaps some of its uh, last meals and also we just stop finding its teeth so i mentioned before about the sharks always replacing their teeth we basically don't find any recent megalodon teeth we only find fossil teeth now emma We've uh, seen some brilliant examples of some extinct uh, species of shark, but there are sharks living today that are just as varied and fascinating, aren't there? Um, so uh, we wanted to, to give our viewers a, a, a bit of a look at some some uh, particularly interesting examples. And our first shark is is, is a beauty, isn't it? <laughs> Emma. It is. This is a beautiful shark. Um, it's actually called the goblin shark. <laughs> and you can kind of sort of see why it's got that name. Uh, the goblin shark actually lives in the deep, dark oceans, uh, at least at about a thousand metres depth. So there's very, very little light down there. So uh, it can't really see. Uh, but one of the sort of uh, superpowers that um, actually all sharks have is that they've got this special organ inside their nose or their rostrum. And that's what basically the goblin shark's got a very big um, one of these organs. And it's called the Ampulae of Lorenzini. So as I said, it's a bit like a sixth sense and it allows sharks to detect an other animals and um, even in the dark or even buried in the in this and the sediment. So every time an animal moves, it gives off an electrical impulse and sharks are able to detect that. So that's how the goblin shark is able to hunt its food. Um, another example would be the hammerhead shark. And that's one of the reasons why it's got this big, long sort of hammerhead like um, sort of shape at the front. Again, it's got this very big organ and the ampullae of Lorenzini at the front to allow it to capture its prey. But back to the goblin shark. Um, if you have a closer look at its jaws, um, again, these are another fascinating feature about this animal and how it captures its prey. It actually extends its jaws out, will grab a hold um, of the, the prey, perhaps a small slippery fish, pull it back inside its mouth to then have its dinner. So if you were to go onto YouTube, you can actually see some video footage um, of goblin sharks uh, capturing their prey. So we've got a diagram here of the goblin shark with its jaw closed. And then a picture of the shark, um, of the goblin shark with its jaw extended out. And you can see there, um, if you look closely at the teeth, they're very slow, um, long and slender teeth. They're um, very, very sharp at the end. It has gotten me a couple of times, I'll be honest. Um, but they're not serrated like the great white shark's tooth that we were talking about earlier. So these are perfect for grabbing a hold of small slippery prey. 
Um, so the reason why the goblin shark is able to do this with its jaw is that it's not physically um, solidly attached to the rest of its skull. So if we think about our bottom jaw, we can move that forward and back. Maybe try this at home. You all look, I'm sure you'll all be looking amazing like this, but move your jaw forward and back and side to side. You can do that. And that's because it's attached to the rest of your skull through tendons and muscles. But if you try and do that with its, with your upper jaw, you can't do that without moving the rest of your skull. And that's because it's physically encased within the rest of our skull. But sharks, their jaws aren't, they're disarticulated, which allows them to extend their jaws out and have more uh, chance of capturing that prey. That would be a great adaptation for the, the deep dark. You can throw your teeth at your prey. <laughs> yeah, <definitely. laughs> Now, the, the goblin shark is, a, is a, a bit of a monstrous looking one, to be fair, but some sharks are simply even a little cute, aren't they? Our next example, particularly, this is one of your favourites, isn't it? It That's is, yeah. Toothy cutter. Yeah, so oh, they look, look, look at that gorgeous, cute little toothy grin. <laughs> um, so um, the cookie cutter shark is actually quite a small shark, typically grows to maybe about 40, cent, uh, 40 to 50 centimetres in size. Uh, so quite a small shark. Um, and the reason why it's called the cookie cutter is how it actually um, attacks and eats its prey. So you can see there on the bottom row of its jaw, it's got quite um, sharp pointy teeth. It's the very triangular in shape. And what the cookie cutter will do is it will swim up to something like a seal or a dolphin. So it will attack prey many, many times bigger than itself. Latch on and do a little turn, a bit like a cookie, a cookie cutter cutting through dough. And you can see how perfectly adapted they are at doing that by looking at their teeth. So basically they remove a circular chunk of flesh and it makes for a great meal if you're a cookie cutter shark. <laughs> So they mainly go for things like seals. Has a human ever been a, a bitten by a cookie cutter? Yeah, so there has been a few um, a few times where a cookie cutter um, has uh, bitten a human. Uh, but often uh, we have to realise that we're in their home, actually, when we're swimming in the water. And often we're splashing around. And especially if we're swimming at dawn or dusk, which is when sharks like to hunt, and we've got a big light on us, perhaps we're next to a boat, that's basically a big sign to a shark saying it's like an all night buffet. So it attracts sharks along. So there has been a couple of times where humans have been bitten by uh, cookie cutter sharks and they've just removed a little bit of, um, normally a little bit of flesh from their, their thigh normally. Um, we've got some. Uh, we've got a picture of, of uh, the results of a, of a cookie cutter feeding. Uh, just a bit of a warning: if, if you're a little bit sensitive, it's a tiny, tiny bit gory. It's not too bad, but if you if you uh, if you are sensitive, then close your eyes for this one. But um, the the prey, they're they're actually fine afterwards, aren't they? They they kind of can carry on. Yeah, so often uh, you can actually find a cookie cutter or several cookie cutters will go and remove these circular chunks of flesh. And think the reason why it eats things like uh, seals and dolphins, removing these little um, bits of flesh, is they're covered in lots and lots of blubber, which is really high um, in fat content, which is a really, really great nutritious meal if you're a shark. Um, so yeah, it won't always um, actually kill its prey. It just goes in, takes a little bite, and then will swim off and leave the animal alone. And to be fair, humans are not very good prey for, for sharks generally, are, are we? No, not at all. We don't taste very nice to them. Uh, we're also not their normal food source. They don't actually like, they don't want to be eating us. Um, and also there's not an awful lot of um, fat and blubber on us. So yeah, we're really not a good uh, meal for them. And it's actually very, very rare for you to be bitten by a shark. There's this. On average, there's about 100 um, shark attacks, so um, bites by a shark a year worldwide. So you would be, have to be very, very unlucky. Uh, but sharks aren't interested in us at all, really. We'd rather just stay Absolutely. away. Absolutely. Now, we've just got time for uh, one more shark that we wanted to show you, because this one has uh, really interesting jaws, doesn't it, and teeth? Yeah, it does. Um, again, this is one of the ones I really like talking about, and this is uh, the Port Jackson shark. Now, the reason why I wanted to talk about this particular shark, again, is all to do with the teeth. Often when you think of sharks, you think um, of the teeth and that stereotypical triangular shape tooth. Port Jacksons don't have these kind of teeth. 
they've got, they've actually got two different types of teeth. They have the teeth at the front of their jaw that are all small, quite sharply pointed inwards. So perfect for grabbing a hold or grasping a hold of small slippery fish, for example. And basically once you get in the jaw, you're not coming back out. But if you have a closer look at the teeth at the back, they're actually very long, elongate, and they're not sharp at all. And so you can run your finger forward and back on there and it won't hurt your finger at all. But these are crushing or grinding teeth. So these teeth are perfect for um, crushing into things, shells of crabs or mollusks to get to the soft uh, fleshy tissue parts inside. So it's very diverse. So yeah, so a, a varied diet, that's probably quite a, a good strategy, isn't it? Yeah, so you can see a closer um, close-up image of the teeth. So you've got the grasping teeth at the front and the longer, flatter teeth at the back. And if you think about it, it's a really great adaptation for that shark to have because it's got a wide variety of food that it can eat. So um, if there's lots of fish available, it can eat lots of fish. But if those fish aren't there anymore, it's able to eat things like mollusks and crabs. So if you, the more diverse your diet is, the more likely you are to survive. We've seen some fantastic examples of, of sharks today. Now, lots of people are a little bit nervous, a little bit wary of sharks. We, we already know that we don't need to be. But sharks are really important animals, aren't they? What kinds of roles do they do, they do in, in the ecosystem? Yeah, sharks are massively important to our oceans. And without them, um, actually parts of the ocean would actually die. Um, often sharks actually feed on the older and sicker fish because what's the point in chasing something that's really healthy and can swim away from you much quicker? So they will go for things that are a bit more, more slow moving, so typically the older, sicker fish, um, which really helps to keep our fish populations nice, nice and healthy. But if you were to remove sharks from the ocean, we've got a very simple food web here, so we've removed our sharks. So we've got these big, grumpy looking group groupers there up at the top. So if there's nothing eating them, what do you think might happen to those groupers, the numbers of groupers? They're going to they're gonna potentially explode. They're, yeah, they'll go exactly. up. If you've got nothing eating you, you're more likely to reproduce and have lots and lots of babies. So the more um, that you have, you are then got to find more food. So the groupers, they that would then eat the yellow tan, which the yellow fish they've got on the screen. And the more animals you've got feeding on them, there's going to be less and less yellow tang around for food but what the yellow tangs are able to do are they actually eat the algae um, in the oceans which often cover up coral reefs so if you've um, um, got um, not many uh, tang left there's nothing left to eat that algae so the algae is then basically free to grow and covers all of the coral reef up and we've actually found examples of that several parts around the world where because sharks have been removed from that ecosystem, parts of the coral reef has actually now completely died out. So that's a really unfortunate thing. Um, but it does go to show that sharks are actually really important to our oceans and making sure that the whole ecosystem remains healthy. Yeah, not only fantastic animals, but, but also, yeah, really, really brilliant for, for the oceans. Um, we've just got some time for a couple of final questions. Um, we did have a question earlier. Uh, somebody wanted to know uh, what it, what living shark was was most closely related to megalodon, I believe. Oh, okay. Know? So yeah, that's um, a really tricky one because, as I said, um, when megalodon went extinct, the whole lineage or basically that whole group of animal and um, group of sharks went completely extinct at the same time. Um, Possibly um, things like the um, mako shark might be one of the um, closest related sharks um, that is swimming around in the waters today. And the mako shark is actually also one of the fastest swimming sharks that are in the oceans. So we've got a picture here of a mako shark. It's got this long torpedo-like body, which makes them very efficient swimmers as well. <laughs> they look quite different from a megalodon, don't they? They're small and sleek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're really maybe about sort of two metres or so in size. So, yeah, much, much smaller. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, a lot of people are quite interested in um, whale sharks. Now, uh, are they the biggest sharks in the ocean? Are they actually a shark? 
Yeah, so it's, it's a bit confusing the name because it's got whale and shark. So is it a whale? Is it a shark? Um, it's a, it is actually a shark and it is the biggest shark that is around um, swimming in the oceans today. So we've got a picture of a shark, um, the whale shark there, and they typically grow to about uh, 10 and um, 12 metres in length. So they are the largest sharks that are swimming in the oceans today, but they are basically gentle giants. And the other part of the name, the whale part, comes from, again, how it feeds. So very similar to um, some a lot of um, um, other whales, they actually eat plankton. So these are um, filter feeders. So basically they open up their mouths, they um, swallow up big uh, gulps of water, and they take the small krill and uh, microorganisms that live in the sea. So these teeth are actually teeny tiny, they're only a few millimetres in size. Um, and yeah, they're often referred to as the gentle giants of the ocean, whale sharks and basking sharks as well. So you can sometimes see basking sharks off the coast of the UK, like um, places down in Cornwall and also off the west coast of Scotland. Well, Emma, we are sadly uh, running out of time. Thank you so much for, for coming to talk to us today about a brilliant subject. Um, and thank you so much to our, our viewers uh, for all of your brilliant questions. It's been uh, to, to be able to answer those for you. Um, Emma, you uh, are very active on Twitter, aren't you? So uh, if we didn't get any of your questions or if you would like to ask Emma any questions on Twitter, um, she would be happy to answer them. Uh, so do please uh, follow her. She, she posts some brilliant um, things from our collection. Um, and uh, yes, is always very happy to answer questions as well. Um, so thank you for that, Emma. We're going to have to end the show there, I'm afraid. Thank you all again for joining us. And we will be back very soon. In fact, join us next Tuesday, where we'll have a scientist talking about plastic pollution. That's at 12 p.m. on Tuesday. But for now, we'll say goodbye. Okay, bye, Alison. Hope everybody at home enjoyed that. And I uh, hope everybody's staying um, nice and healthy as well and safe. Thanks very much. Thank you.